Good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate everybody taking this time on another Tuesday and we welcome you to our fifth Tuesday talk. Um, today I'm very excited that we're going to be focusing on the destination of Central and West Africa. And I'm joining you today from Johannesburg where I'm starting the fourth week of my road trip with my children around South Africa. In the past three weeks we've been very fortunate and then we've been traveling across to many destinations in South Africa, especially exploring the Karoo, which is one of my ultimate favorite places since I was born in Beaufort West and went to school in Grafrenet. So we started off our road trip at Kwandwe, uh, where we got involved in, in, in hands-on conservation participation. Uh, mainly over there, we did a cheetah relocation where we combined two male cheetahs. They were both in the both um, lone cheetahs and a new male had joined into Kwandwe. So we darted the other male and we, we tried to get these two males to do a, create a coalition. I just had an update from Angus this afternoon to say that they, the coalition creation is going really well and they seem to be creating a bond and they'll be set free and hopefully get out into the wild in the next few weeks. From Kwanwe, we went through Grafrenet, it showed my children my old school grounds, and we went up to Blomhof Karoo, which is the most beautiful farm stay experience on the N1 for anyone driving up between Cape Town and uh, Johannesburg. And from there, we went into a private game reserve. A friend of mine owns just outside Colesburg, which was just over 50,000 hectares of absolute beautiful wilderness areas. And I'm currently in Johannesburg, as I said, with my brother. And this whole time we've done amazing back roads and dirt tracks and seen some spectacular scenery across South Africa. And once this, we are allowed to start traveling interprovincially, or if you've got a friend that you can get a special permit for travel for, I do highly recommend getting out and enjoying our country as much as possible. The good news from this week, which follows on from two weeks ago when we did our last Tuesday talk, is that Tanzania is now open for business and we have seen a nice increase in business as well and new bookings coming in. The news about Kenya opening, which has been taking place over the last few days, together with this, uh, Kenya's opening on the 1st of August. And because of this, we are already seeing nice new business coming into the whole region. Um, and it's been fantastic and so, so positive to see the, the a new business rolling in and bookings coming in for August and September this year, which is even more exciting. So it's like short term travel, which is very exciting on that side. Rwanda, of course, is opening up on the 1st of August as well. Zambia is open, but they're still insisting on a 14 day quarantine. Mozambique looks to be opening up quite soon. And South Africa, well, we're getting there slowly but surely, but we are hopefully going to be opening up in the next um, not too distant future. I think really what shows though within the Tanzania and Kenyan um, uh, um, situation is that regions do need to open. You can't just have one country opening in isolation. We do need to be opening up as regions as a whole. Um, so today's talk, we're going to be focusing on the Congo Basin, which is going to be Gabon, uh, Sao Tome Principe, Republic of Congo, and the Central African Republic. The Congo Basin makes up um, one of the, the most important wilderness areas left on the earth. It is at over 500 million acres. It is the world's second largest rainforest. And it is, um, it is larger than Alaska, and it is also larger than the entire landmass of Argentina. So it's wonderful to actually start exploring this destination. While the savannas in Africa make up 65% of the African landscape, the, 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 the rainforests only make up 22%. But today we're really going to start exploring about why we should, be just, we should be traveling into these areas far more into the future. One of the questions, which is actually the whole premise of what this discussion is today, but a question that was posed by Steve Banner from Wildlife and Wilderness in, in the UK is, how do we get the greater safari public to consider the forests of the Congo Basin where they are so preconditioned to wildlife sightings in the open in the open savanna areas. So that is really the question and the whole crux of what today's conversation is going to be is what does the safari beyond COVID look like and what are the opportunities for this new safari destination going forward which we are certainly very excited about. Um, 
I would like to, on that side, just start looking at some of the aspects of what we do love about the Congo, and that there's such amazing different uh, landscapes and topographies. Yeah, we've got the forests, we've got beach areas, we've got rivers, the savannas, which you often forget about within this, in the, within this Congo area, and then the byres, which are these saline rich um, openings within the, within the forest areas. And then the wildlife is absolutely extraordinary from mandrels to chimpanzees and gorillas to forest elephant and buffalo, um, the pygmy tribes and the most amazing bird life as well. We do hope that you're going to enjoy discovering this amazing destination with us. On that note, I'd like to introduce you to our panel. And here we have to start off with Elsa Gilman, who's joining us from the Congo Conservation Company. Elsa grew up in the Comores Island and has been working with international companies and expanding into the Congo since 2013. She co-founded Azania Voyages, which is how I actually got to know her as a tour operator, and has been with a Congo Conservation Company since 2018. And in her spare time, which is something I would love to do, she flies airplanes, which is super cool. And then we have Ron Cassidy, who's an absolute legend within the whole travel industry. Uh, I call you Dumbledore as well of the travel industry, of the travel world. But Ron Cassidy is the owner of Sanger Lodge. Um, he's a renowned South African uh, ornithologist who purchased Sanger Lodge in, 20, in 2008, which at that time was a hunting lodge, actually. And he did this together with his wife, Tamar. They are passionate and the most inspiring and highly regarded conservationists. And I have the highest regard for everything that they have done in their little corner of the Central African Republic. And, in, 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 and then we have, of course, Congo Conservation Company and um, Sanger Lodge partnered in 2019 to, to further develop sustainable tourism within the Congo Basin. We then have uh, Paul Telfer, who's joining us from um, SPAC. Uh, Paul, of course, needs very little introduction and is actually the main reason why I'm here today hosting this, this uh, webinar. It's thanks to Paul that I actually got involved in the Congo right from the beginning. And it was when he was previously the CEO of Congo Conservation Company, uh, but he has now moved on to the role of Director of International Conservation and Communications for Sabine Plattner African Charities. So it's wonderful to have Paul with his amazing experience and how he can combine all these areas together. Uh, Paul is an American born primatologist with lots and lots of stories. Um, and he has a foundation in research and investigating primate viruses and the origins of HIV epidemic in West Africa. He started off in Sierra Leone and then he went to work for WCS in Gabon and became the country director for WCS in the Congo before he joined CCC. We then have uh, Yanni and Matteo from the Gabon Wildlife Camps, and we're delighted to have them join us today as well. Um, I think Yanni's story is the most intriguing out of all of these, as Yanni grew up in the Namib, so he's far from the forests of the Congo, as anybody can, can possibly imagine. But he studied hotel management and hospitality in Bloemfontein, and he started his career at the Lanzarote Hotel and then the Red River Lodge and Sun City before moving to Principe Island, where he set up Bomb Bomb and was there for 15 years. He moved to Gabon in 2016, where he founded the Gabon Wildlife Camps. And we have joining with um, Yanni today, Matteo, uh, who's of French national and grew up with his family business in a renowned French restaurant in Paris. He has studied uh, hospitality in Europe as well and arrived in Gabon in 2013 and has since been working in Luango um, since then and joined the Congo Conservation Company in 2018. Um, he's passionate about sports fishing and marine conservation and lives together with his wife and his little five-year-old daughter in Luango. And finally, and most beautifully, we have um, Philip Philippe from HPD in Principe, which is um, Sundi Principe. Philippe is a uh, French Portuguese with a strong background in sustainable tourism. And he has been responsible for the tourism development of HPD Principe for the past 10 years. So we have a really strong um, panel with us today. And I'm delighted to introduce them to you and give you a chance to um, have open discussion with them as well. Kara and Kimmy are our ghost hosts at the moment, and they're going to be checking out and sending us any questions that you have. So please just pop the questions into the questions uh, box at any stage, and they'll be sending that through to me so I can ask those questions of the panel as well. So just to give you a little bit of a background as to where we are, I love maps, and you can see this is the classics map. 
but we all need to know a little bit about where we are. So just starting for the Congo Conservation Company, based over here in Odzala Cacao National Park, uh, bordering onto the one onto the um, eastern side of Gabon, over here on this side. We are a two-hour flight up from Brazzaville, in, in access-wise, and then from Odzala, which is 13 and a half thousand square kilometers, we fly up into Bom uh, to Cabo, over here, where we've got a landing strip. And from Cabo, you do a six to eight hour wonderful, wonderful river journey to Bayanga, where we have Sanga Lodge in the Zanga Zanga Special Reserve, which is this bottom little triangular corner of Central African Republic on that side. So um, Sanga Lodge over here and the Odzola Discovery Camps make up the Congo Conservation Company. Moving across to Gabon Wildlife Camps, they've got four destinations uh, where they've got the camps in uh, Luango National Park, uh, which is beautiful, which is very well known for its fantastic sightings of seeing the um, the elephants and the elephants on the beach and the the hippos surfing. Then you then go to Lope National Park, where we're seeing mandrills and beautiful, um, wonderful scenery on this side. Iwindo, which is the wonderful waterfalls and byes and river systems, and then you go to Pongara over here, just south of Libreville, where they have another camp as well. So they've got four different lodges in four areas, or di different camps and lodges across um, Gabon. And then, of course, finally, we have um, Sundi Principe, which is HPD Principe, which is part of the Sao Tome and Principe Island. These are the second smallest little island grouping after the Seychelles. And we call it the Galapagos of Africa, one of the most beautiful areas. And you have these sheer volcanic um, spires rising out of the ocean. And you fly to Sao Tome. And from Sao Tome, you do a quick hop over to Principe. Principe itself is only about eight kilometers wide and 16 kilometers long. So it's a beautiful little island. And two thirds of it is a UNESCO declared biosphere so it's complete tropical rainforest on that side as well. So the first question I'm actually going to be asking is of our panelists is just first of all three things about well first of all how they landed up doing what they currently do um, in the within their destinations how they got involved in it and three key selling points for their destination. So just a quick summary of what makes it special, why do you do it, and how in heaven did you land up doing it to start off with. So Elsa, over to you to start off with. Thank you, Suzanne. And hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining. Um, my path to ecotourism and conservation definitely hasn't been a straight one. Um, it took a couple of detours. I started um, seven years ago in Congo when I was still working for Ernst & Young um, in the International Tax Division. And one of my clients was opening up um, a branch in Congo. Um, so I traveled to Congo uh, with the board and then saw that there's actually, it's an amazing opportunity um, to start freelancing and start doing tax and business consulting. Um, and I started working with CCC on a part-time financial consulting basis in 2018 and then joined the management team full-time as of last year. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with what CCC is doing. I fell in love with a team of incredibly dedicated people who just, you know, they, they work so hard to make it a success. And um, yeah, I think the fulfillment for me that, you know, came sort of from the transition of corporate into working in conservation and ecotourism, um, has been so fulfilling and it's just been such an amazing shift um, that gives you context and it feels like you're contributing to something so much greater. Um, and that convinced me that it's something really worth pursuing. Um, yeah, so that's my background and how I ended up in CCC. <laughs> um, and then in terms of the three things that make Odzala unique and special, I think my first impression when I first went to Odzala was how absolutely authentic it is. Um, it's not touristy. It's still um, a place where you feel like it's a unique discovery. You're the only person there. Um, it's dense forests and beautiful rivers and, and it feels like every moment is so unique. So, um, you know, in contrast to other destinations where you hear safari planes overhead or see lots of game vehicle drivers, um, you know, Odzala for me was just so peaceful and um, a safe haven away from the hustle and bustle. Um, I'd say the second thing that I absolutely love about Ngaga is the fact that you can start your gorilla trek 
from where you're staying. So you're staying in this beautiful lodge in the heart of the forest and the gorillas could even choose to come to you. So it's, you wake up and you know, you have your coffee and the, the adventure starts from there. Um, and it's a very intimate experience because there are only four permits per trek that are issued. So um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's intimate and you really get to share an hour of living with the gorillas and seeing exactly what they do normally um, on a daily basis. And, and it's almost like you're not intruding. Uh, CCC does very ethical gorilla treks in that um, you know, we introduced masks way before COVID was even a reality. Um, and from, yeah, from that perspective, um, it's, it's yeah, trying to keep the gorilla safe and really just um, you know, observing them in their natural habitat, doing what they do every day. Um, and then I think thirdly, the absolute diversity of the place. And not just talking about elephants and you know the mammals and the the charismatic monkeys but every day at Zola is a discovery um my favorite insect is the spraying mantis it's a uh, yeah it's it's green and pink and it's almost like every day that you spend at Zola, you're going to be discovering something new i was absolutely blown away the first time i saw an african gray parrot fly over my head and it wasn't in a cage i'd only ever seen parrots in cages before that um so yeah, the longer you spend at the Zala, the, the more you'll discover and find things to be amazed at. Thank you. I was going to be showing a few more pictures of some of the camps and uh, at Zala Discovery Camps. It is, I feel exactly the same as what Elsa says. The first time I went, I was totally astounded that there was this part of Africa that was so extraordinarily different to the savannas and the East Africa and that we've kind of got to know so well. Thank you, Elsa. And now I'm handing over to Rod. So, Rod, your little story, uh, which you can try and keep as short and as entertaining as possible, <laughs> and what you love about Sanga and why. I mean, you've given so much of yourself and of your family and of your life to make this rather lonesome destination something in so special and to really protect it. And as I said earlier, I have the highest regard for what you have done. Well, I got there. Thanks. Thanks for that, Suzanne. Um, it's, um, it's made me blush a little, but I've got a beard so nobody can see that. And a red face anyway. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I was always into, into uh, travel and tourism, uh, especially adventure tourism. So I started uh, my interest in, in Central African Republic started only after I'd already been to Gabon. Um, Yanni, you might be interested. I was at Akaka in 2000 um, for the first time. Uh, we set up a camp there and camped in the bush. Uh, so that's when I first started in Central Africa, was running trips to Gabon. Um, but we were never seeing gorillas. So then we went to Adzala and we started seeing gorillas there, lots of gorillas. And then they had Ebola and I had to look for other places. And that's how we ended up going to, to Central Africa. Um, actually, I see Justin Wartridge is in the, in the audience. Um, uh, Justin and I and another guy, anybody from Cape Town will know the name, John Matham. We did a recce there in 2004 together. And um, I just fell in love with Sanga Sanga. I thought it was just the best place, mainly because of Zanga Bai. It also had gorillas. It had Zanga Bai and it had pygmies. It had the, the Baaka culture. The, you could do net hunting and you see these people as part of the ecosystem and not as 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 as, um, as threats to the ecosystem, rather as a part of the ecosystem, and that 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 really blew my mind. But like that, the uh, the um, that's how I ended up there. As started as a tour operator, but then it um, running tours there was never easy, and I decided that I would start a lodge when I heard of this hunting lodge that. It, been abandoned for a while and, I, and uh, we started the Sangha Lodge um, uh, with the intention of, of, of making money and, and, and um, putting that into conservation. However, we, never, we still haven't made any money um, because we've had civil wars and now COVID and so on. So it goes on. But we do carry on and, and um, they keep the, the civil war tended to make us focus on what's important. 
and that was to to get uh, more into the conservation um, and we became more conservationists than than hoteliers and so it, this whole thing I think this COVID is going to make us refashion our business again to be even further into conservation than before. Uh, we work a lot with pangolins. Um, that came about by accident and uh, that's become quite an attraction. Sometimes we have pangolins that, 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 um, that are habituated that have been released and then a while that, that like now we still have one that we're studying and following, Koki. Um, and if, if there's tourists there, they're welcome to join our research teams and go out to see, see the pangolins. If not, there'll always be somebody in the camp, scientist, uh, Tessa Uman. In fact, she's giving a talk on the LCA talks tonight. If anybody wants to tune into that, just drop me a private message and I'll send you the link. Um, then, uh, um, yeah, so, so, so you can always go out with a the scientist. There's, we have the biggest trees. In, in, in the whole of the Congo Basin, I believe. I mean, I haven't seen trees like that in Odzala. Um, I've seen a few big, really big trees on the Gabon coast, but I, I think we have the biggest trees. We have bongos, we have, uh, we have Sangabai, which is just unique. And it is a place that compares with any Savannah wildlife experience. Thanks, yeah. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Rod. And then moving on to Yanni and uh, Matteo from Gabon Wildlife Camps. Uh, just a brief as to who you are and why you love uh, Gabon. And what makes I'll share, my, I'll share my time with uh, Chus. I'll, um, I'll, be, uh, I'll be quick. Uh, yes, Luangu has a, especially Luangu has quite a, a stormy history. Um, well, I worked in, in South Main Principe. I worked for, for Africa's Eden before for Dr. Swanborn. And in fact, I was on my way back to South Africa to join my wife and kids. They moved to South Africa for schooling. And uh, I was asked just to pass by and see what is left of, his, uh, of Dr. Swanborn's um, investments here. And then I got, got stuck. So that was really just to stop by. Um, I met Machu Luangu, went through a little bit of a, of a difficult time at, the, at that moment. And I subsequently also uh, ran into into Mike Fay, and uh, currently Minister Lee White was the was the head of the Parks Board, and sort of together we decided that okay we know all this drama going on, but we can't let this Luangu dream or this Luangu thing just um, go down the drain. And uh, between Mike and uh, uh, Minister Lee and myself, we sort of convinced everybody. Uh, that the best option would be for the parks board for ANPN to take over the lodge and at least restart the operations. Um, at that time, we got Matthew on board, so we we were running basically Luangu on on a really on a shoestring, but um, together with uh, with the support of the parks board of the ANPN. And then around 2018, I realized that you know it's unless you put this whole thing together for people, it makes it really tough. And I suggested to, to, to Lee and to Mike that we create a, a private company that sort of takes care of the logistics and um, the whole, you know, put the whole process together. And that's how Gabon Wildlife Camps was created. And I also looked at all this heavy infrastructure investments that people have all over the place. And I thought, Yo, you know, the only thing that you do is you fight, you fight for these expensive structures to, to, you know, to, to be maintained and exist. And I said, okay, let, you know, let's follow the old principle of a bit, do, do it camping style, put people a bit closer to the nature. And we started really from nothing to build a small camp um, whilst we were operating Longo Lodge, which was called Luri Camp. We rebuilt Akaka Camp and then got a bit inquisitive. So moved out to Lope and Evindu as well. And yes, so we just started building this thing up, enormous support from, uh, at least from the ANPN and from, from, uh, from Minister Lee. And uh, yes, that's, that's how we actually build the capacity that we have at the moment. There's obviously some challenges. I mean, uh, both Rod and, uh, and Paul will understand that very well. Um, logistics is the same problem that we all have. But 
basically in Luangu, it's our flagship operation at the moment. Um, Lupe was something that was moving on nicely. We had to stop that a little bit because of the COVID. But we also thought that the most amazing thing about uh, Gabon is that, I mean, in Luangu, in the 1500 uh, square kilometer park, you have these different ecosystems. You've got the lagoons and you've got the beaches and you've got the forests and you've got the savannas and this big uh, uh, estuary system and the lakes. Um, but on the bigger picture in Gabon, you have that same combination and, and different ecosystems, mountains and forests and waterfalls. And it's just such an amazing and unique destination in, in that sense, a relatively small country and you have all these things together. So that's what, that's what caught uh, me. And uh, yes, it's, it's safe. It's unbelievable. Uh, there's really for us never an issue about safety and, and concern, concerns about that. Um, and I think it's still something incredibly authentic. Uh, it's a place where you can go to without any, I mean, just to give an example, Mathieu and I were at uh, Peti Luangu just two days ago, and we, we really sat in the car and watched a leopard probably about 25 meters from us for five minutes, and it was just sitting and staring back at us. Never saw a, a human a car or a human before. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit my story. I got stuck here since 2016, and I'm very happy that it worked like that. And as I said, I met up with Machu, so he can tell you a little bit about his part okay. of, the, of the deal. So on my side, I arrived as guest in Gabon in 2009, and I just felt in love with this uh, amazing country and this, uh, these dreams that I had since when I was a child to, to look at this Congo Basin and this amazing forest. And it's a little bit funny, I listened to Elsa speech and uh, Rod, it's always a question of passion, authenticity, and it's always the same thing which comes around between uh, all this uh, amazing and uh, incredible Congo Basin. I will mainly speak about Luongo. What makes me think that Luongo is really a special place? I didn't travel so much in Africa. I, was, I moved in a few countries before, but I never worked uh, for a long term in these countries. But just long ago, I cannot move from this place. I arrived seven years ago and I didn't move. I didn't went back in Europe. Even my holiday, I want to spend that in this place because there is always something different and something to see and something to discover. You can have, depending on the season, this amazing way watching, this gorilla trekking, this uh, birds which are quite specific from the Congo Basin, these uh, animals on the beach, this hike in the equatorial forest. And uh, we try to, 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 to share this, uh, this uh, we try to, to, to offer this to our guests. And I really think that all the guests who arrive in Gabon with the correct expectation uh, just felt in love with this really special place. That's it. I can speak for hours about my Luongo because it became my Luongo for almost seven years. And uh, uh, we just opened with Yeni. Uh, Yeni is now the head of this Gabon Wildlife Camp company. And he now organized everything for the guests since Libreville to, to Lope until Pongara Lodge. And every not different national park has his special, uh, special like me. Special niche, yeah, uh, exactly. special, special thing. Yeah. Much you like fishing as well, by the way, which is a very important part of our <laughs> business. A question on that side I have to ask because, you know, I'm very involved with the, with the other three um, companies represented over here, or four companies represented. Um, just the one thing, and, and a lot of people in their, in their questions leading up to today's discussion are intrigued by Gabon because um, I personally feel, I'm not blowing our trumpet over here, but I think that we've made um, South Tome and Principe, um, Odzala, the Congo plus um, Sangha, relatively well known within, within the trade and we've really focused and extensively on easy access and how to explain how to sell the area. It, to be quite honest, from my point of view, if I think about Gabon, I know about Luanga because that's the most well-spoken, but the rest of it is like a black hole. So I know the park's names, I looked up them on, on, it looks amazing, but how on earth 
do you combine the destination? I know we're going to discuss it under challenges, but just as a quick summary now in terms of, you know, you've got these four dest areas, but how does it logistically work? Is it private charters, scheduled charters, uh, you know, an angel that comes down, or what happens? How do we get around Gabon? Yeah, the first interesting thing that we have absolutely no charter companies at this moment in Gabon. We haven't had any for the... Um, so we do it quite authentic and we started to come well actually to push that a little bit as part of the experience which is not easy uh, look for example any window by train or by car which is not easy the train is actually quite comfortable but it can be a little bit unreliable from times I mean you can end up with a with a delay but it's, it's really comfortable the drives are long uh, we try to do stops, we try to stop, for example, close to Lupe on an archaeological site and combine that a little bit. We try to stop at a place called Njoli at a food market. I'm sure that uh, Paul and uh, Rod will be familiar with that. Um, so we, we make that a little bit part of the adventure. We typically decided that one of the best ways to reach Luangu is to go from Lupe via Lambareni, because you have the whole Albert Schweizer History there. I also think that the Uguia River has got such an important um, history. I mean, it's been such a, a trade route for, for how many years? So we do the boat trip from Lambarini then to Luangu, which is about a four hour trip now. And then the last hour and a half by, by road to the lodge. Alternatively, you can fly to Pojanti and then with the new road that was built, it's about two and a half hour drive from Pojanti to the lodge, which is quite easy. I mean, it's half an hour flight and two and a half hour drive. Um, just to summarize it, yes, it's still complicated. Um, Ivindu is very complicated. For the moment, um, also now we, we focus a little bit less on Ivindu. We will get back into that. But we simply decided that, I mean, these are the limitations that we have at the moment. We're going to deal with it. And we simply make this, this drive, so this travels part of the adventure. And we try to make it as interesting and as... Um, as comprehensive as possible. Great, but thank it's you very much. We'll, we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail a little bit later as well. So moving on from that, we're gonna to go to Philippe with the HPD, where we, he's on Principe Island. We've got the same pictures at the back here, Philippe. Hello, Susan. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be part of this, uh, this group. Um, how did I get involved? I, I'm, um, I did hotel management in Switzerland, was lucky enough to work in many different places, Asia, Europe, uh, Africa, South America, and uh, started to do some projects with Didier Lefort, which is a French, uh, half French, half Moroccan architect who's based in Paris but lives in, in, uh, in Marrakech. And uh, suddenly he got involved in Saint-Tobé and Principe and they needed somebody to do hotel development for, right from the beginning. So. It was literally in a week he called me, he said, I'm, I'm involved in this incredible project, would you like to tag along? And uh, when I see, you know, I didn't know where Santamon Principe was like most of the people. It was, you know, it was an un unknown place. The only thing I knew it was an ex-Portuguese colony. Uh, it became independent in 1975. And, uh, and as you said, you refer it second smallest uh, country in Africa after the Seychelles. And it, I just got curious. And, and when I went there, I, I was just blown away. You know, the, the, the uniqueness of that place, the, the biodiversity, it's, it's totally unspoiled, very small scale tourism. You know, there's about 10,000 people visiting Principe, uh, 80,000 visiting Saint Tome. So, so it's really a, a tiny and, and it resonates with what Ilsa was saying as well. You know, it's, it's so unique and so authentic because it hasn't been spoiled by tourism. So that was really what convinced me to, to get on board on this project. Um, another highlight I would say is, is, is the, um, the, the agriculture and, and the, the culinary journey that you can have. I mean, you find some incredible fruits, you find some incredible vegetables that you've never heard of. And, and you can really combine, yeah, there's some amazing pictures there. You can really combine and have a, a, an amazing culinary journey there, eating very simple things, but absolutely delicious. And it's, uh, and, and it's been a real uh, uh, attractiveness to, to our guests. They, they absolutely love the food. They, they find something that you, you yeah, you can see the, the cacao on the top there. Um, as you know, it used to be one of the biggest uh, cacao producer before the revolution in 75. And, uh, and now we're trying to revive this whole cacao story. Uh, we recently actually organized a, a, a safari, a, a 
tropical chocolate safari with Joanne Harris, the, the, the lady who wrote Chocolat, the, 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 the book Chocolat. And it was incredible because she had never seen a real cacao pod, you know, so it was a real discovery for her to, to learn about chocolate much more than, than when she wrote the book, you know, so it was, it was a, a fantastic experience for her. So we did that a few, a few months ago. And maybe the third reason why we, 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 we love the destination and it's try to preserve as much as possible what is there. As you said, you, you referred at the beginning, it's a biosphere reserve, which started in 2012. This is a good example here. You know, we, we don't build totally on the, the beach. We always build away from, from the sea, you know, giving like 25 meters from the high tide. We try to integrate as much as possible so that when you see it from the sea, it's, it, it merges into the existing uh, uh, forest. And, um, and, and we as well into conservation, we support very much a, a, a local foundation, which is called the Principe Foundation, which works in, in collaboration with HBD. There's a great turtle protection program that we, we support uh, uh, extensively there's three kind of turtle there green turtle hawksbill and and the amazing leatherback and um yeah i mean it's for who haven't been to santa ben principe it's it's a destination it's a it's a it's a box that the box that you need to tick if you if you're interested in in, in really discovering unique uh, unique places just for the story we uh, just to to wrap up um i met uh, an american uh, um traveler um uh, i can't remember his name now uh, Jack Wheeler from Jack Wheeler Exhibition or Expedition, and he visited Santa Man Principe. That was the the last place or the last country that he visited out of the 192 uh, country in the world. And he was blown away with this country. He said that was probably the the he finished. You know, that was the cherry on the the cake because after having visited all the countries in the world, that was the last one he visited, and 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 it was probably the one which had the most impact on him. So, an amazing destination. Thank you. I have to echo that. I, when I, the first time I went to Principe, I was completely blown away. I think the, the power of this little island that just erupts into the middle of nowhere and these, and these beaches and this ocean that drops away, it's just like, wow, it feels like you've gone back in time and you feel as if you're going to see some dinosaurs or something coming around the corner. It is just spectacularly beautiful. So thank you for that, Philippe. I appreciate it. And then we've got um, Paul, and I wanted to keep Paul last on this because as somebody who's lived and worked across many of these African countries and worked in Gabon and um, extensively across the Central African Republic as well as Republic of Congo, Paul, what is your take on why you love working in this area, why you can't seem to let it go for any reason, and, um, and, and give us your input on things. Thank you, Suzanne, and thanks, everybody. Um, the the Congo Basin is just a life changing place. It's absolutely amazing. It's you know it's almost twenty five percent of the continent, and yet it's still unknown to most people. And the first time I arrived back in the mid nineties, it blew my mind. And I came to Africa in nineteen ninety one, and trying to do look at the zoonotic infections and the origins of the HIV virus. And when I got to Gabon in ninety four and saw my first wild gorillas, I, it just blew my mind. It is what I was dreaming of. It was the rainforest that I had dreamt of when I was a kid. And um, I decided in the early 90s that I wanted to dedicate my life to protecting this wonderful place because it is under threat. The national parks are not well managed. The governments, with the exception of Gabon, are not that interested in managing their national parks, or they weren't. And so, Anything that we can do as, as individuals and organizations to try and help conserve this absolutely beautiful, stunning second lung of the world, um, we should do. And that's why I keep going back. That's why I keep working for it. That's why I'm dedicated to the Congo Basin. Um, whether it's the Central African Republic, DRC, Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon, Sao Tome and Principe, Gabon, it's all just amazing. It's it will blow your mind when you come there and it's authentic. It's one of the, the people are some of the warmest as you know, Africans generally tend to welcome their visitors every time they meet you with a smile. But these countries don't get a lot of visitors and people are really surprised when they get there. It's, it's safe, it's wonderful. And the, 
the fact that ecotourism is starting to happen in the Congo Basin is absolutely essential for the survival of these pristine rainforests. Um, it's a conservation tool and everyone that does come is actually helping conserve these wonderful pristine landscapes, whether it's the coast of Gabon, whether it's the island of Principe in Sao Tome, whether it's Zangabai in Central African Republic or anywhere in Congo, the people that come, it transforms them. They become ambassadors for the Congo Basin and we absolutely need that support. And if you are interested in coming and having an authentic experience, uh, really understanding and exploring and feeling that you're doing something that few people have done before. The Congo Basin is a place you can do it and you can do it safety and comfort. And it's absolutely astounding. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate that. And actually on that, I think I'm just going to give the, the, the roundup of the map again so everybody can just get a quick summary of where we are. And then I'm going to stop sharing the screen and we can actually just focus in on our panelists. Um, but I think what we're going to do next is, you know, as Paul has just said, um, the Congo Basin or these rainforests make up 25% of the African continent, yet they are still relatively unknown. And ecotourism is absolutely essential for the survival of this area going forward. So today we really need to start unpacking how are we going to, as, a, as an industry, and that is the people on the ground here who are doing the most extraordinary work. And out of, every, out of all so many other destinations that I've been to around Africa, I look at people like Yanni and Mateo and Paul and Rod especially, and Philippe and Elsa and, and the teams on the ground and the, the effort that has been put in, in rather challenging circumstances, what you have done to protect this part of Africa is absolutely extraordinary. And we really do need, as a greater tourism industry, to stand behind you as leaders in what you are doing in those areas and start supporting you by sending you guests when travel starts resuming back in Africa again. So I really like to start unpacking that. So the first thing we need to do is we have kind of discussed some of the challenges and maybe we shouldn't be focusing too much on the challenges because there are quite a lot of those, but some of the biggest challenges that we have in all these destinations, which is something we're constantly, constantly working on. And I know from us on the marketing side, it's the first thing that we try and deal with is how do you get there? Um, are you going to fly? Are you going to drive? Are you going to go by a boat, a plane, a train? What is the What is the transport method? And one of the biggest things which I actually spent time with Paul doing was opening up a path and a passage which took us from Odzala and it looks really close but getting from here just to there was extraordinarily difficult and you had to move heaven and earth to get you know the customs clearance and the government's to just to support going on a boat up a little river and it seems so logical but it, it's a real challenge and we're having discussions about how we could possibly get, get, get air access from Weso into Libreville because it seems so logical to be able to combine these destinations and then from Libreville get into Luango, Lope and even Lou through charter flights. And then from Libreville, it's a hop and a jump. Libreville to, to Principe is almost the same distance as South Tomé to Principe. This is a triangle in this area over here. But at the moment, to get from these destinations, you have to go via Brazzaville, via, 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 somewhere else to get around here. So access is a challenge. The other challenge that we have is a very, um, English centric destination is, is that it's when you get to this part of the world, it is very Francophile, French, Portuguese. So there are language barriers coming to these areas as well. And the other, the other concern or the other challenge we have is the perceptions. There's this perception that you're going to, I don't know, just be covered in bites and it's going to be a lot of sweaty, gritty, dirty, and it's a challenge and it's heavy going. I'm telling you, as somebody who does not like to camp at all, I actually refuse to put up my own tent, but I can seriously rough it. I love it. And it's not that difficult. As Rod knows, the worst thing I did was stump my toe really badly after too many gin and tonics. But guys, it actually isn't that challenging. You don't get bitten to shreds. I've been to parts of northern Zambia and into Botswana and Zimbabwe where it was hotter and heavier going. It's actually a welcoming, benign, and I, and I know the panel is predominantly male, but it's actually a very female-led destination. The forest, the trees, it's got an immense sense of beauty and 
quiet power that just stands by itself. So we need to get over the perceptions of these areas. Um, so let's talk about the opportunities and dispel some of these myths in that. So the, I'm going to open it up to the panel to talk about what we're going to do. And I think Rod, since you've been around the longest and okay, you're not the world's best at marketing sometimes, I'm going to be quite honest, but Rod, how would we, how do we start, you've coming from a tour operating background, how do we start getting, dispelling myths and start generating more opportunity in this whole area and what can we look forward to going forward on things? How do you dispel the myths? Uh, that's only word of mouth. The more people we get through there, the better and, and the better understanding we'll have. The more operators who see the place, the easier it is for them to sell the product. But um, it, it, yeah, as you say, it's it's not a difficult area to 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 live in. It's a difficult area to get around in because even though Gabon is right next to Congo, there's no connection between Gabon and Congo and Gabon and, and Central African Republic or Central African Republic and Congo. It, you you have to do a huge circle if you want to go in between these places. So um yeah it's 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 difficult um the the circuit we have between us and odzala is a good start uh, i'd love to see the coast of gabon get pulled in and i'd love to get to saratama and principe at some point that would that would always be the 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 week or the five days at the end of the trip where you go to get some some beach time and and, and relax a little bit but um i think um uh, all the trips I did in Gabon, we always sent the clients off at the end to say a in Principe. I never actually went. Um, but yeah, Gabon is Gabon is huge. It's got wildlife that we haven't seen, and it would be really important to pull that beach wildlife. I mean, you didn't mention manatees, you know, when you were there, but yeah. you've got manatees. You've got. I saw a golden cat and a manatee on the same day at Lango. The first, the very first day I was there. I've never seen another golden cat or a manatee in Africa since then. Um, it's it's just an awesome place. I so I don't know how to pull them together. It, it's it's going to, yeah. You know, we need it. We need one plane that hops between the three places, or four places. Well, we are having those discussions already. It's one of our biggest things because we recognize that access is the biggest issue on that side. But just in terms of opportunities in this area, Philippe, what do you think the opportunities are going forward for us to start um, creating more awareness around, uh, around Congo Basin and, and Principe? So uh, as you know, the, the, the access has been, has been uh, one of the, the big uh, showstopper for, for Santa Bé and Principe. Um, it's only there's only one European airline going to uh, do Santa Mé, and after it's a little hop from Santa Mé and Principe, because you know there's no critical mass on 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 in Principe and and in Santa Mé. But we are feeling a real difference now. We are seeing some operators who are interested because there's there's definitely an opportunity in the region, because it's 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 um, you know Principe could be part of a of a bigger West African. Uh, air access policy and and I know that the government now they're, they're looking at seriously at this because they've been a bit pushed by the, um, the, 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 the World Bank who is helping the government to go through this COVID uh, crisis and and one of the, the challenges that they're asking the, the government to address is really to to first to remove you know sentiment principle from the blacklist uh, uh, issue or, or ban and and to come up with its own you know air access solution which would serve the region you know so they're, they're stopping to look at only Santa Man Principe they're starting to look you know the region and I think that you know for the colleagues here and that's one part of a discussion we already had with with Elsa a few weeks ago that you know we hope that in a few months there'll be you know some 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 opportunities where synergies between these destinations could become really uh, uh, viable. Fantastic. I totally agree with that side. Um, and then uh, would, um, Yanni, what from your side, Yanni and uh, Mateo, what do you think is the opportunity and where do you see how we're going to grow tourism into these areas? Yes, um, I mean, I can just reiterate what, um, what everybody's contributed. It's, um, I mean, for us to be able to, to have people after long Forest experience or, uh, you know, spend the last few days on Principe. I know Principe extremely well. I mean, that would just make make enormous sense. 
Um, so we have all the same, we have the same connectivity issue. That's, op that's obvious. So we, something that we need to, to work with. I think at least um, in Gabon, we have the willingness from the side of the government to, to help us to address that. Um, we're in the wonderful position as well that um, uh, we have Lee White, who's a minister at the moment, who's completely committed to, uh, to, this, to tourism and to these efforts. Um, the other thing that I think it's important that, um, I mean, is that everybody, and I'm not talking so much about the people on this panel at the moment, but I'm talking more the people in Gabon, the other operators, we all need to really appreciate and understand the responsibilities that we have, responsibilities towards the, the parks, towards the fauna and flora, the responsibilities towards the local population, and the responsibility that we have towards the, the tourists and the visitors. Um, if we can make sure that everybody have that same sense of responsibility and that everybody treats this with the same amount of respect, then it will make a big difference. We do have the problem in Gabon <clears throat> that there are some operators that are, you know, it's like, they, today I need my money, I don't care if people come back or not. So you have a lot of people going back <clears throat> with really a, quite, a, quite a bad experience. I mean, um, the people that are feeling ripped off. And unfortunately, uh, that is something that we, that we then have, have to deal with afterwards to convince people that, sorry, but you know, you just had a bad experience, but it's re not really like that. So uh, for us, it's also in the sense, how do we pull this whole thing together and make sure that everybody um, sort of share that same sense of responsibility? Um, and I think, I mean, what we're doing at the moment is probably a good start in, in that direction. Um, you know, uh, everybody together looking at these things. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the language barrier. For us, you know, working with local guides, working with the, with the guys from the villages, for us, that's absolutely part of, part of the product that we, <clears throat> we have a constant issue trying to get our clients away from the, from the guide camps at night, sitting around the fire there. And, you know, we want them to have a cognac at the, at the deck and you see them all of a sudden sneaking off to the, to this guide camp and sitting and talking to the guides. But that's the sort of experience that we try to, to push. Um, but we need training. Uh, so that's for us one of the biggest issues. How do we access, uh, at least for now, French-speaking uh, trainers that can develop our personnel um, and make sure that they can, can provide a service to the, to the, to the English-speaking market as well. So that's my take on that. I mean, Mathieu, I don't know what the... the... No, that's true. I mean, we are, as Vianney mentioned before, the main thing for you and the important thing for us, it's, uh, it's to work only with local guides because we are in a remote place and it's our part of conservation. I will try to explain it uh, as well as possible. In fact, all the people who are working with us, if we don't offer the Jose, uh, if we don't offer them a job in our place, they will find their resource around or inside the national park. So it's quite important for us to involve them in our project. But there is still a big, big challenge uh, because international guests doesn't have at the moment the same experience than resident guests because part of our market is uh, Argentine people or Libreville people who are coming for holidays or weekend and they have a amazing experience with the local guides. And now we are trying to work on a better training uh, with our guides, so it's one of the challenge. I will just come back a little bit before about the access, because access is also quite a challenge to, to reach uh, Longo, for example. It has changed a lot in the last years. Uh, before it was hours and hours of boats and uh, uh, not really, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, comfortable, yeah. comfortable uh, travel and everything. But now we took the guests by the end since Libreville until our place. And it's one of the, of, it's really part of the project. So we have a team in Libreville, we have, it's our own car, we bring the guests to our place and, uh, and we try to, to make of this difficult travel a proper experience and an adventure, which is part of the product that we are selling. I think that's the one thing that has really come across clearly is the sense of responsibility and working together.
in a, in a destination that is still opening up like this, the collaboration across the companies that are represented in this talk today is absolutely essential. To know that we each have each other's back, that we are all supporting the destination and growing awareness for the whole of it, I think is absolutely critical in that. And then to the next step would be, which is what I want to speak to you about, Elsa, is in, you know, one thing that CCC has done well, and it costs an absolute fortune for them to do it, is the air access and making things easier. Because I, when I first spoke to Paul, about going to Gonzalo and he said to me, oh, it's a 14-hour road transfer. I said, well, there's absolutely no point in me doing it because I can't sell it. There's just no way I'm going to have anybody that's going to drive 14 hours to go and look, to go and sit in the jungle. Uh, yeah, there might be a gorilla, but hang on, that's not going to work in my world. So what is going to, so the, the access has been absolutely brilliant from the CCC side. So where do you think the opportunities are going forward? Yeah, so just to say it's 14 hours if you're lucky in the dry season. I think we've had a drive that went on for 23 hours from Brazzaville up to Mbuku. So yes, driving um, is not an option for us. And I mean, the reality is um, leasing an aircraft is an incredibly huge overhead for any standalone company. So, you know, just benefits across the board in terms of sharing that overhead um, and making and creating at the same time exciting tourist circuits for guests who come in and just creating that access across the board um, is, is something that would be ideal. Um, one thing that could really make it easier um, is not having to go all the way back down to Brazzaville. So for example, if we could get the, the Congolese government to agree to make WESO an international airport, we guests can, you know, go through customs and immigration at WESO rather than having to go all the way back down to Brazza before they, they go anywhere else would also, you know, be a, be a huge plus. So those are all things we, we're looking at currently. Um, in, in a way, COVID brought us a bit of time to relook at, at the way we do things and, and you know, we, we have a bit of time to, to reassess what circuits could work best and have these sorts of conversations. Um, but it's definitely probably highest on the agenda at this stage. I know that's one of the questions that we get asked in terms of when you're marketing Satsume, Principe, Congo, so all these destinations, the constant question we get is what can we combine it with? How can we come? We've had so many people wanting to do Ozala Principe and it's just like, oh, don't ask me that. It looks so logical, I know, but it's, you know, so it's a challenge. Paul, from your you side. To, I mean, sorry, can I just interrupt you, uh, yeah, Suzanne? Sure. Just to historically, you know, in 2000, 2001, 2002, when I was running trips, uh, we were running um, Libreville um, to Odzala. So we would go Libreville to Lope, Lope to Odzala. We would fly into Odzala from Lope and fly back out to, to Lope and back to Libreville. Um, and then the clients would go on to Sayatama and Principe. So, so, I mean, historically it used to be done. But there were a load of charter companies in, in Libreville at that time. Um, but, you know, I don't know what the future holds. Yeah. And, but, but Rod, why, what has happened? Has that been, a, has that been an, an industry thing about is this stuff in, in, in Gabon as a whole? Because Gabon's actually holding the whole thing together. You're the central peg over here. If Gabon had air access, it could go in each direction. That would be a massive help to, this, to all these destinations. Well, as Yanni said, there's no charter companies in Gabon at the moment. It's, the irony is of, of, of all the countries around there, Central African Republic has got more charter companies than the rest put together. Yeah. yeah, just in the wrong place. Okay, Paul, on your side, um, where would you, what would, as, and as being in very involved in all these destinations and now within your role of, you know, it, it being driving the conservation destinations through SPAC, what do you see as the opportunity in these areas and how would you, what is your um, ideas for the future in this? Well, you know, it's interesting because each of the governments where we're working is very interested in diversifying their economy and they're all making tourism a pillar. And if a government tries to stand alone, then it's just going to be selling one product. But if we all band together as operators and sell a destination, the Congo Basin, or the rainforest of Africa, or the west central part of Africa. We need to create a single destination where people think Gabon, Central African Republic, Sao Tome, Congo. And that's gotta be the message that we get out into the general public. 
and we've got to all work on that together. But then internally, and I think that CCC and the linking that we're already, the CCC is already doing with Sangha Lodge is a perfect example of how an aircraft can really liberate and open up the entire destinations. And yeah. fortunately, the government of Gabon, as Yanni said, with Lee White in the ministry, and the work that CCC has been doing on the ground and this COVID break, as Elsa said, is an opportunity for us to really work independently, but towards this common goal of opening up the airspace. Because if one of us has an aircraft and it's just flying between one destination and the capital city, then we're not optimizing. And we can really go a long way. And you know, if CCC has an aircraft that can then be used by the Gabon wildlife camps or can then go on to Sao Tome or up to Rod's Lodge directly, whether it's via Weso or directly between Lope and Ozala, those are details that if we're all creating the same message together and talking to our governments in the same language, then hopefully we can make that happen in the future because we need to create a destination, not just a standalone. You know, Ozala is known, but who wants to just come to Ozala? Most of the people that were going to Ozala were like, what do we do next? You know, that was fabulous, but what else is there? You know, can we go to Gabon? Can we go to Sao Tome? Well, yes, in principle, but... Uh, <laughs> well, we know, but we saw that. The minute we got out Zala going, everybody said, well, we want to go to, we wanted to go to Sangha. And now we've got that, it's now we want to go to Gabon. And, and we're linking in Principe. So the whole thing needs to work together, which actually goes to a really nice question that Chris Roche put forward to us, is that how do we view the post-COVID future of 2022 and onwards? And do you see a change in public consciousness as it relates to the environment, the planet, and the geographic connectivity? And do you see this uh, driving greater demand for the products of this, this uh, nature going forward? So on that note, what I'd like to do is looking about what do we see the, 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 the future customer looking for, and to start looking at some of our conservation impacts as well so we can look at the the new the IUCN protocols over, over gorilla um uh, gorilla watching and Elsa don't know Elsa you and Paul on, and even Rod if you want to input on that and I know we're all working together on that side I'd like to speak to Rod about what's happening on the pangolin side is the pangolin the start of the whole COVID crisis um space for giants what is the impact of space for giants in in Gabon and what is HPD doing on the Principe side so we get, we are coming towards We've got half an hour to go, so I just want to wrap up these things because we've still got one big question that we need to get through as well. So, Elsa, do you want to discuss the gorilla experiences on that side? Um, yes, so uh, we're very closely involved with um, the SPAC researcher, Marta Bermejo, um, who's, you know, we wa it's wonderful to have her at the site because she's, she's getting first-hand information around new developments and IUCN protocols. Um, and there's a, a huge move towards ensuring that um, it, it's, a, it's not just a case of changing the gorilla tracking experience, but, but really creating consciousness with people that, you know, we, we need to protect the planet and, and all, all the actions that we have have an impact on, on the people around us so, and, and, and the environment. Um, so the, the kinds of recommendations that seem to be coming through is the, the distance between people and gorillas when they do the tracking is likely to increase to 10 meters. All of these, it's still under discussion, but these are just the developments we're seeing come through. Um, looks like mask, gloves, and um, um, will have to be worn and very strict protocols around cleaning your feet, not leaving anything in the forest, not letting disposable masks fall in the forests, And, you know, so, so just being extremely aware of every aspect of what we bring into the forest needs to come back out and there needs to be absolute respect um, you know to to ensure that nothing gets transmitted because I mean the reality is COVID's probably not going to go away anytime soon and we need to find a way to manage the risk consistently and constructively um, while still making these experiences available in the long run um, so so these are the developments we we are seeing coming through in the conversations that are being held um, but they obviously need to be formalized um, and, um, you know, we are in discussion with all the parks around Otsala. We, we're speaking to APN, obviously, who's, who's the park management for us. We're speaking to WWF um, for Zanga Sanga, um, as well as WCS for, for Nambali and Doki. 
And everyone's currently the, doing the same thing in terms of um, even with the Gorilla monitoring assistance, they they um, trying to you know sort of do the daily chores without and, and keeping the research up, but without creating any risk for the gorillas. Um, and we also in consultation or, or just sort of in information sharing uh, with each other too, to also when we, it comes to looking at park reopening dates, that everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet and that we, we're all aligned in terms of saying to the public, okay, these are the dates when we're re-looking at parks reopening um, so that we're all doing the same thing. You've been muted, Suzanne. Suzanne, you're talking to yourself. Oh, shit. Okay. Um, <laughs> the dogs are barking outside. So just on terms of active participation and getting involved, Rod, what is happening at Sangha and what are good, especially with pangolins? And uh, do you want to have any sort of comment on uh, the pangolins' contribution to um, COVID? Well, briefly, what's happening at Sangha with pangolins is um, we do have a research program and we do have a researcher who is not in place. She's stuck in, in the States. If you want to know more in depth about that, she is giving a talk tonight on the LCA Talks. You must message me afterwards and I'll happily pass you the link. Uh, pangolins and COVID, um, I think it's been categorically proven pangolins were not the transmitter of COVID to anybody, even via bushmeat, but they do carry a lot of the COVID viruses. And I think Paul would be better qualified to talk about viruses and, and the like, but uh, they do carry that. But what is important about the, the whole COVID crisis is that it has highlighted that bushmeat is a huge problem for zoonotic disease transmission, and we have to deal with that. And we have to take advantage of it as conservationists to, to, to educate people that it is a big problem. COVID is not the first disease that's been transmitted by, from animals to humans. The HIV virus and many, many others have been. Uh, Ebola, for example. Um, they, they can, uh, it, 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 we can take a huge advantage of this. And I think it has already been shown in Gabon where, where pangolins have been uh, made illegal in bushmeat markets now. Uh, I think they've taken pangolins and bats have been mandated, uh, legislated out of bushmeat markets. So they are now um, not allowed to be sold on markets. Um, and then in China, where they've, where they've taken uh, pangolin off the, the list of pharmacopoeia, which means you can't have pangolin scales in your, listed in your ingredients in Chinese medicine anymore. So, and that's a government um, proclamation. So yeah, but but they they didn't they're not they're not going to give you COVID no, but you know, they might give you lots of other things if you eat them. <laughs> I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, Yanni and uh, Matteo, what new developments are going to be taking place in Gabon going forward? Um, and there's lots of interest in this as a destination. What is in what is on the cards? There's certainly a lot of talk about things happening in that area as well. So if, are you at liberty to share anything with, with us? Yes, I think we, we are. Um, in fact, like uh, I think a lot of people have mentioned that already, that this whole COVID thing has sort of given us all a, a bit of a chance to shake our heads and get ready for the next round. Um, it also gave us the opportunity, at least with this uh, wildlife camps uh, company, that I managed to get a, another investor in, inside who took a, who took quite a big uh, portion of our shareholding for, for capital. And I also managed to get the, the National Parks Board, ANPN of Gabon, as a, as a shareholder in this company. So we've built up quite a lot of capacity with that, um, which is uh, obviously very nice, first of all, because it gives us a bit of capital. And with the ANPN inside, it gives us access to a lot of new possibilities. Uh, Parallel to that, um, there's also Steward and the Space for Giants involvement, which I think most of you maybe know that they've been given a mandate by the by the government, by the presidency, to sort of to to facilitate investment into tourism. Um, one of the things that Steward were working really hard on, and he was moving quite well, was the aviation question. So, which is something that I think we should sort of bring into the picture in the near future again between uh, between all of us. Um, that's uh, 
obviously can can help us to resolve that. Um, Space for Giants now have quite ex access to to decision makers in government, in civil aviation, um, in the presidency as well. So that's that's something that unfortunately stopped now with with the whole COVID story. But um, I've just spoke to Stuart not long ago, so that will be moving forward. And then from from our personal side as well, as I said, with the new with the new investment partners and with the ANPN now official business partners in this, um, yes, we hope to move into a into a next level of of this business. Um, we've actually started building a new camp, uh, which will eventually replace Luangu Lodge because it's still with some complications involved in it, and we would like to stick to our principles, which is really to be in the park and to be as close as possible to the wildlife, to the wildlife and to give people this experience. Um, we've also in the process of employing uh, Dr. De uh, David Lehman, who's, who's for the last four years now, I think, responsible for the Mandrel project in Lope. He will become our sort of in-house uh, conservation expert or conservation uh, coordinator, director, call it. We've just um, the same investors that bought into into wildlife camps made a substantial uh, investment in the Mandrel, Mandrel project and in habituation. Maybe a second group of uh, gorillas in, in Luangu, which is on the go at the moment. Um, uh, I thank Elsa for the information because we have the same worries. We want to know what's happening with these gorillas. It's changed our whole product completely the fact that we had these gorillas um, and uh, I'm happy to understand that there's, there is a plan um, from from that side. Uh, at least Max Planck must be working on something as well. So yes, we hope to have uh, more minerals colored and so that we can continue the research on that part and um, obviously having tourists participating in these research projects. There's a giant pangolin uh, tagging thing which has been really going well there's two giant pangolins with the satellite trackers on them in lupe we hope to be following that as well as you know with the research and and getting tourists closer to that if we if it can be done safely and if we can guarantee the safety of the pangolins and the people so there's a lot of things happening and there's a really really uh, enormous amount of energy it got a little bit choked by COVID, but i'm sure that it will probably just take off with double the speed once um, once this opportunity arrives again. Well, I certainly do believe in the world going forward that the destinations that are offered in the Congo Basin are going to be more sought after than ever before. I think that we are primed and ready for this new traveler who's looking for something unique. And I keep saying to our trade partners, sell something different because really there are going to be so many other places that people can start booking by themselves and we need our trade partners to still be that really strong connector between the guests and between these destinations and we need them to be our ambassadors in terms of spreading this message internationally as well about these so the final question that i have and i'm going to ask this to philippe um, to start off with this is what advice should we be giving to the people that are listening today and to those that are interested in sending guests going forward what advice do we have for them in how we can build awareness of this destination and how they can start selling more of it and why they should sell it so if you could give us two things that you feel are absolutely essential for anybody that wants to sell more business into south to me we would love to know and you are mute at the moment thank you <laughs> thank you susan and i just wanted to add one more thing i mean you know this COVID thing we, even the big players who do not have sustainability as part of their DNA, like this group has here and, and what you're representing very well, uh, Suzanne, in your portfolio, they're really looking at conservation and sustainability as being part of their, their, their DNA. And, and you know, the, the people are going to more and more travel for a purpose. And people who are into conservation and doing the right thing will benefit from that. I'm, I am convinced about that. And it's as well you know, what, how, what are you doing during these difficult times? Um, everybody's suffering, everybody's going, you know, through, through difficult financial, you know, pressure, but there is always something that you can do which will benefit the destination. So, so we thought about that as well in Principe and in, 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 um, in collaboration with the regional government, we decided to 
you know, turn the one of our existing property bonbon into a, an isolation center so that we could protect what the, 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 the president described it as the library of Principe. So we've got artists, we've got healers, we've got historian, historians there who are just, you know, we're protecting them from COVID to make sure that the history doesn't disappear suddenly, you know. So I think it's always about the, the right thing that you're doing and people will be really, it will resonate in the travelers so that they want to go into a destination who's doing the right thing for the destination and for their community. You know, that's number one, I think. Number two is, is about, I think we are all in the same thing is that we are in, in, in the B9 Africa, you know, it's very safe. It's, 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 it's not difficult destination to sell, I would say, because they are so unique in their, in, in their own purpose and they are, they are very similar, but all, offering something totally um, um, unique in in this whole region you know um, the only thing that we're really missing is to having the right air access that we we're working on but um, it's definitely a new side of Africa that you know people are, are not used to it and sustainability and conservation is really the way to promote it and I, and I thank you again for putting all these people together because that's the way people are looking at, you know, they want to travel and make a difference when they're traveling and we're the right, you know, we, we're answering the right question, questions right now. Absolutely. Thank you. I think that there's really good points over there. Elsa, how are you going to add on to that? Um, just in terms of how we can be helped, I think it's probably come across in every single talk, but please postpone, don't cancel. You can hold on to bookings um, for guests who want to come. You know, we'll do our best to accommodate dates. Um, you know, as soon as parks are open and, and we have, you know, we know we know when we can operate. Um, so that would be a huge help. Cancellations are killers. Um, and then, you know, uh, just to um, echo Philippe, you know, these are unique destinations and they are... The, the places where, you know, it's, it's not commercialized, it's authentic. And it's where you can really immerse yourself in nature and discover something fantastic and amazing every day that you're on this journey. Um, and absolutely, see as much of the Congo Basin as you can when you come. Make a, make a round trip of it. And we're working on putting those circuits together to make it possible. Thank you. And actually, Rod, I'm just thinking of you and one thing. We one question that we get, and, and which makes me think of the postponed don't cancel, the one question that we keep getting from tour operators is that, you know, how do we know somebody's going to actually survive COVID? And I think of all people, um, surviving COVID is the least of your worries and everything else that you've had to deal with in terms of dealing, being in the Central African Republic. But in going forward and how we're going to sell more of these destinations, and there's no doubt about it, you are certainly going to survive this because you've survived a lot more. But how do you see travel forming in the, uh, going forward and how, what would you recommend to the tour operators that are listening? Nobody can see what's going to happen, but um, I... I I, I, I predict that uh, there will be a slight change because a lot of flights are going to stop. Um, um, so that we'll have to reschedule our dates and departure dates. And I think that's going to cause us all some problems. Um, but yeah, we're definitely planning to, to, <laughs> to stay in business. We're not planning to open very soon, though. We're, we're planning at this stage, we expect by the end of March only to be able to open economically. Um, rather than, than say we'll be opening in November, then shovel people off into February and then shovel people off into April. We're going for, for the deep end first and, and we'll, we'll, we'll stretch as far as we can until the, till the end of March before we open, we think. Unless something suddenly dramatically changes in the next two months, um, a vaccine appears, it gets manufactured in the billions of vials in two weeks. I don't see that's possible. Um, yeah, so, yeah, but we will be open. But I can see that uh, the airlines are going to change. They, a lot of them are going to have closed a lot of routes. So, you know, instead of having seven flights a week from Nairobi, as we have now, we'll probably only have two or three, but we will definitely have flights from Nairobi. It's a very profitable flight for Kenya Airways because of all the UN traffic between Nairobi and Bangui. 
Yeah. So on your advice, then it would be just to really look at how to build the itineraries because of a complete changing schedule in terms of our flight access and not, and not the flight access that we have control over, but all the other, the bigger flight access. I, I think, I don't think we need to change the, the itineraries too much. It'll just be change the departure dates is, is really what it'll turn down to. At the moment we have very nice schedules in Bangui and Brazzaville, but, but I think those could change. I don't know. I mean, we, we don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, that's it. Uh, Nyanya Mateo, what would you recommend? What is your key uh, message to the trade that are listening to us today about how to sell Gabon and why we should be driving tourism into this destination going forward? Um, if I may uh, start, I think that, I mean, that's something that I've been trying to to promote and I motivate it myself like that. I mean, we, this world population consumes everything that comes in their way. I mean, wood and, uh, and uh, the petroleum and mining. Uh, I mean, in Gabon, this mining is developing day by day. So I think once again, I mean, we don't have huge investment investors or investment funds behind us. We really ask people to, to come here and to support us and to trust us to make a difference as far as the, the national parks are concerned. Um, we try to stick to that philosophy that um, we all, we really want to, to make sure that the, that the money that we can generate, a big part of that goes into, into giving alternative solutions to the, to the population around us. And for that, we need, of course, we need uh, support from, from the international clientele. We need people to come in and say, okay, you know what? Wow, we're gonna spend 10 days with you or a week. And if we can make this whole thing more attractive, um, by by including this whole portfolio, this is this whole panel in it. I mean, that just makes sense. If we can can reach that point, I think we will we will really be on top of of something incredible. Um, we're very fortunate. We are open because we have quite a big international uh, uh, resident um, market, as much mm -hmm. as explained from Paul Gentil. Um, he's built the incredible data bases of clients, so we can't take people to the same number, but we've already had guests in Pongara last week. Um, we have another group this weekend, and we plan to launch at least our Akaka camp in Luangu um, and the Luri camp in, for the next weekend. So yes, we, we survived, and uh, we, are, uh, we are open again. International business will take time, as uh, Elza was saying as well. I mean, we need to see how this... Uh, gorilla thing works out that's very important of course people will be extremely disappointed if if they can't go to the gorillas or the mandrels so that will obviously play a role but yes um we we really need people to come back to gabon and to support this thing because we have an incredible responsibility towards this continent and these rainforests that's been feeding our hunger for, for resources and for timber and for minerals and for oil and for everything. We have enormous responsibility to at least look after what we have control over. And that's, um, that's what we try to use as a motivation to say to people, please come here and help us to, to fulfill it in that. I like that in terms of it's actually something else we were talking about with somebody else where we're saying for every breath that you take and for every bit that you consume in the Western world and how we, we are, we, we actually going into debt in terms of our own consumption in, on the planet. We actually have to go back to these destinations and we have to put ourselves back into credit. And by supporting all of the companies that we have in front of us today, you are actually putting credits into your, into your bank account, so that when, into your lifestyle account, so that when you go back to your consumptive world in the Western side, you can, you can offset some of this. So yeah. I think to wrap it up, I would love Paul to give us his viewpoint on how you would, how you see, and, and you've always been such a great spokesperson for the whole destination, but how do you see and what do you tell people to, why they should be selling more in the Congo Basin? Well, again, um, it is an absolutely authentic African experience that is, is complete, and you will feel complete when you visit. But what's interesting, and I think what we need to let the market know is that this is not, this is no longer a new destination. 
whether it's Principe or Rod's Lodge and Sangha or CCC or Gabon, everyone's been operating now for nearly 15 years and it's a proven destination. And you just, the, the feedback that everyone gets from their guests is absolutely phenomenal. And I think the operators that are out there, they need to get ahead of this wave because what's gonna happen is when things move back towards normalcy, I think I'm, I'm forever the optimist. I'm sure that the gorillas and the IUCN guidelines, they may be modified, but they were already very good. And I don't think they're going to stop tourism. That just doesn't make any sense. It's not good for the gorillas. It's not good for the countries that are the host of the gorillas. There may be some more distancing, um, whether masks and foot baths and gloves are required. We already require masks. I know that in Gabon, they require they respect the IUCN guidelines. In Central African Republic and Northern Congo, they respect the IUCN guidelines. So we're ahead of the curve. And I think that the market and the, the, the agents and the, the, the operators out there should get ahead of the wave and, and realize that it's not just us. I mean, every guest that comes, comes out and has a, a life-changing experience in a very positive way. And so when things start moving back, I think the the old way of doing tourism may fall behind, but we're not part of that old way. We're the pioneers. We're the ones, this, this group here are people that are offering an, an, a new African experience where your participation is actually helping save these rainforests. It's helping these communities who depend on these rainforests and it's helping the people who come and visit by fulfilling a, a, a deep sense of, of what is important to them. So I, I would just encourage everyone to start thinking of this as a new destination. I'm not a new destination, but, but the, 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 the destination. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think to wrap that up and um, actually Jim Holden, well said. Jim, Jim Holden said it from Stephen Covey's emotional bank account, but it, I think it comes to our environmental bank accounts. We need to start thinking about what is our environmental bank account and are we making more deposits than we are withdrawals? Because when you come and visit any of these destinations in the Congo Basin, you are certainly making a massive deposit into an environmental bank account that offsets what you are doing in other destinations. Um, I believe very firmly that the only way we can start driving more uh, more business and more beds into these desk, into the, all of these lodges over here is, is that we can really, for our trade partners to completely support us. Come to us at any stage. We will give you any marketing support and material that you possibly need in terms of getting newsletters out there, starting this narrative about new destinations, but think about selling something else. I know we have camps in Kenya and Tanzania and Zambia and Botswana and all those destinations, but really, drive the narrative and drive your efforts to selling something in the Congo Basin. And I urge every single one of the over 120 attendees that we've had on this panel today, each of you just to send us one booking, just one booking in the next 18 months. 120 of you sending us one booking to each of these destinations and we will be eternally grateful. But that's what you need to do is just find that one client that will do it. Because I know, and we've got lots of the um, operators on here, when they've sent that one, it starts rolling because you get confidence in selling the destination. You start realizing actually you're quite cool because you're selling something totally different to what everybody mm -hmm. else is selling. And it gives you, our trade partners, a competitive edge. You're not competing with every other agent out there that's selling the Serengeti or anything else. So start selling unique. Start trusting your gut to do different destinations. And believe me, that people out there want it. it. When you talk about these destinations, people's faces light up, their hearts go on fire, and they think there's an adventure waiting out for them out in the world. And I firmly believe we should all stand behind selling more adventure, more connectivity. And when you get to these places, your life really is transformed. The first thing that I felt was I would realized that I could, didn't know Africa at all. And this is a part of Africa that I have absolutely grown to love. It's quite exceptional on that side. Um, to wrap up, I'd like to say a really big thank you 
to our panelists. There have been questions coming in about opening dates. I'm going to do a roundup of everybody's opening dates uh, just to reconfirm. I mean, I know we said that CCC was opening up just before December. We're now pushing that out a little bit. Rod has said March. Yanni and Mateo said they're open already. Philippe, we'd said Dece early, just before Christmas, we'd said for, for, student, for Principe. I know the news has come out that Sundi and the prior, uh, Saltame is open for flights, but I know you said we were just opening up just before Christmas. But I will reconfigure and rechat about those dates. We'll look at what air access is coming in and we'll send you a roundup to everybody um, that is listening to this panel today. But I'd like to once again say thank you very much to our attendees for joining us for this hour and a half session. Uh, we're back in two weeks again. I can't quite remember what we're discussing, but it'll be something exciting. I think it might actually be Zambia because Zambia seems to follow on from the Congo Basin quite well. And um, thank you to everybody today uh, for your inputs and most of all for your absolute passion. I admire all of you for doing what you do. And I take my hat off to you for the, the inspiration and the dedication that all of you have shown to making a difference to this part of Africa. So thank you very much. And thank you to my team as always for putting this all together. So on that note, I'm saying goodbye and we'll chat to you soon. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.